Now action. No. Okay. How's everybody doing this week? Good. Good? Yeah. Yeah. Nice, nice uh, start to the winter ish. Temperature's finally dropped. It's cold. Yeah. I don't like it. Got the wood stuff going, so that <laughs> makes me happy. Feels yeah. good, huh? Well, uh, I guess I'll start with prayer and then read the last little bit of this section. I think there's only a couple pages left in, uh, in seven where we left off. Huh? All right. Well, Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for everybody gathered around these tables today. Um, Lord, we're eager to uh, to receive your word and uh, to share in our growth together um, in discussion. And uh, Lord, we just ask that you uh, build up Pastor and, and guide him through his message for us today, and let us all have ears to hear and, and eyes to see, um, and just be prepared to receive you. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I think we finished off. Uh, we have one right here. Good night. One fifty-seven. You need a book? Yeah. Yeah. One fifty-seven. There you are, sir. Thank you. All right. One fifty-seven. We need a sensitive word from God. We'd like to start off reading the first portion. Okay. I'll start. <laughs> we want to notice a final word from Paul in the amazing passage. He has outlined for Timothy both message and method for ministry in, a chaotic, in chaotic times. The leader should convince, rebuke, and exhort but he must make sure he does it so with all all long suffering and teaching what exactly does paul mean here as i read the words i realize that paul is speaking particularly to me as a pastor as i teach god word god's word i need to be very patient we leaders can be discouraged at times when we feel that no one is listening we look out across the sanctuary and ask ourselves is anyone really interested in learning about god's word today is there any chance that someone out there will actually apply this to, to their lives? God instructions for me is, is to be long-suffering, to wait however long it takes to do the work of ministry. And remember, remember the harvest is His. If I begin to play God, insisting that things work on my schedule, I will drive people away. How do we see that working around us? <laughs> right now in our current environment I'm losing patience with people trying to explain things one way or the other you get frustrated with people not quite grasping what you're trying to tell them <laughs> or when you're communicating mostly over like social media and stuff i can't imagine how difficult it is to be a pastor or other trying to give a message or convey a message when you don't have facial expressions right. um, people's responses anything to go on you're just preaching to a camera Right. Or, you know, kind of like when you're having a conversation with text message, email, or social media, you don't see that person. So you are only taking their responses with your perspective. So it's so hard to get that sensitivity or that empathy because mm -hmm. you're not feeling that other person's true emotion when they're right. responding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter how, uh, you know, empathetic or compassionate you are in your life and how you act towards other people, you still view the world through a particular lens. You still bring your preconceptions and, and you know, your preperceptions with you. And that, you know, that slants the way you view things. And so it's going to be hard for me to see the same, things the same way as LJ does or that you will do. Um, there are going to be little things that are different that I'm not going to be able to grasp. Uh, you know, our life experiences, everything changes it. And so when it's, we know this, and yet we get so frustrated with one another when we're trying to talk about something that's important to us, like, oh, why aren't you getting this? You know, like, why isn't this important to you? It should be. When, you know, it's just not part of their, <laughs> not part of who they are. And so when I came to my parents this week and said, told them all about this conversation that I had with my daughter, about how she doesn't understand religion and why doesn't she get it and they just looked at me like oh we totally understand because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was me there. for years with them <laughs> 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 they, totally, they totally just looked at me like mm, yeah. 
Yep. Now you know what we were going through. Right? <laughs> yeah, so that, that long suffering and teaching, I mean, what, what can that look like? Just taking the extra time, right? Asking questions, getting feedback, like you said, being in person. Sometimes you don't think somebody's getting it, you think, oh, they're totally not getting this, and you don't realize that they are getting it. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. they're, getting, yeah, they're getting, yeah, they're getting more than you're thinking, and then something will happen later that you realize, oh, hey, you they were listening to me. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. You know, we can't always expect that. I think everybody wants like that on that response right then there. You know, <laughs> you don't always feel the light shining. Yeah, yes. the table. But you don't always get that. No, you don't. You know? <laughs> you might not see their light bulb. Little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. playing with little bit. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And One it's... little thing at a time. Yeah. And what you say, I hear what I hear. John hears what he hears. What that he hears. You can say the same, I mean, there's, you're saying the same thing, mm -hmm. but everybody perceives that. Yeah. In a different way. Yeah. yeah. It's true. Well, that's important because, you know, we all bring perspectives. We all perceive different things. It's like when, uh, you know, they're building a case to go to court. That's why you don't only have one witness. You have multiple. Because every one of them, their story is going to be just a little bit different. But each of them combined, and that's also true Gives with the gospel. Life. Yeah. People like to point out the inconsistencies and the, but they're not inconsistent. They're different perspectives and written for different purposes, supporting a different case to different people. You know, one gospel is written primarily for Jews, another gospel is written primarily to teach the Gentiles. Different perspectives coming from different places for a different purpose, all supporting the same case. And I kind of straight off a little bit. <laughs> Back to that sensitive word. <laughs> but that's what we do here. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And this patient is not just for preachers. For example, there are wives who have grown deeper spiritually than their husbands. They've been able to attend Bible studies or spend time in personal study while their husbands are devoted to their prayers. Wives, too, need to be long-suffering and patient, be gentle and loving, while letting God do the work of the admonishment and conviction. All of us, as followers of Christ, need to be sensitive. We forget that the Spirit of God is always on the move, always seeing the big picture that we don't see. We can't know what is in the minds of others or what the future holds. What we can do is be obedient to Christ and to his word, and that means being loving, patient, gentle, and long-suffering. Well, and that goes right back to what you had said, you know, you we're expecting this response, this change, you know, like, this should happen now. <laughs> you should get this now. So I think that can be frustrating that you're not, you know, you're not seeing these things. Yeah. Yes, wives are long-suffering. She dealt with me for a long time, just dragging my feet, going to church with her because it was the right thing to do. But she kept praying for me. What? She was patient. I finally heard stuff. In my time. <laughs> yeah. I won't hold on to that too much. <laughs> no, it happened in God's time. Yeah. It wasn't anything to do with me. It was all of him. Right, so where to bury the treasure that to pick up? It was February of 1944 when a little dust clock stopped yeah, on the street. An agent of the Nazi get the capital stood in the living room of the Cory Ten Boone's family. His eyes studied the book on the shelf. You, the old man there, he barked. I, I see you believe in the Bible. It, it is a true each morning before he opened his, his watch shop, Corey Ken Boone's father, Casper, held devotions with his family. This focal point was a large base hinge Bible. Casper would, would read a chapter and lead a prayer and begin the business day. Then at the sunset, the family would gather around uh, again and take up 
where they had left off in the morning's reading. <clears throat> His young child and daughter remembered him reading, Thy that word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thou art my hiding place, my shield, I hope in thy word. Psalm 119, 105 to 14. The child wondered what all that meant. Uh, hiding place, what kind, how could the word be a hiding place, and what is there to hide from? This was a dark day when she would, would discover her answers. Old Casper, his four adult children and one grandchild were ordered out of their home and marched to police headquarters. There they awaited an uncertain fate, having been charged with secretly sheltering Jews who were under persecution by the Germans in holding cells in the ten booms, ate the, the meager meal they were given, all together in a crouching darkness. Only one thing gave them a, a taste of home, time together in the word. Casper had devotion as if he were any other day and other place. The great Bible was out of reach and there was no light for reading anyway. But it didn't matter because he had buried the word in his heart. The hiding <coughs> place no enemy could invade. He knew the passage of comfort, chapters, and verse. Wow. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's just, I can't imagine facing that how frightening that must be for an adult, but a kid too, you know, in that yeah. time, you're not knowing what's going to happen. You don't have what we have, all this information around us all the time with the internet, and we can see things and stuff's coming. I mean, these, they were just sweeping through these neighborhoods and these towns, gathering people up. I mean, that's, that's horrifying. But they had the treasure of the word away in their hearts and they, were, they had it prepared. He had it ready. You know, it was just business as usual, just a little darker. <laughs> um, that's why we need to know. Right. Yeah, that's why we you need to be in on the to, word. You yeah, need to yeah, read yeah. it because You're you have to remember. Yeah. You have to be able to remember it when you can't, when you don't have it in front of you. Yeah. Like that. Because, yeah. I mean, I'll be able to bring up verses. I won't be able to go, okay, that's Matthew, such and such. I wouldn't, but I would know the verse. I just wouldn't know where to get it from a lot right. of times. Yes. Now I can bring up like bits and pieces and then I have to go and get my Bible because I'll be like, it was either Ephesians or Timothy and I have to go. Sometimes I have to go and I have to find it because I have to place it. Mm -hmm. Was it Timothy chapter three or was it Ephesians chapter? There was something recently that I wanted to find. Mm -hmm. And so I had to go and I had to find it and I had to place it because I wanted to know where that specific paragraph was about what I wanted to because it's here, yeah. and I want to know at a grasp that I can go get it. And I was, it was one of the two. Yeah. <clears throat> so, like, I, but I can't quote a whole lot specifically like that, per se, word for word for word. I will mix up words and stuff. I'm not a good memorizer. But I mean, how, uh, same. <laughs> still, how good is it to know that those, that he was able to bring that up? Especially when you're starving and in fear and terror and going through what they were going through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, my memory's bad, you know, now it's getting worse. And, but I spent enough time in the Bible, my grandmother, my mother, my sisters. We've spent enough time in the Word. I can't tell you where it is, right. mm -hmm. but I can tell you some verses. Mm -hmm. I can tell you stories. I know all that. Yeah. I can't tell you exactly where they are, unless I have my Bible in front of me because it's all highlighted. Mm -hmm. you can probably <laughs> there it is. Pretty easily. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, yes. and I think it's more important that you can remember some of that, but it's also more important, you know, to <laughs> understand and study the Bible versus just simply. <coughs> Memorizing, you know, going Where down the line, and, and yeah, yeah. yeah. the parts are written on the heart that, yeah, right. You know yeah. the lies not. You're internalizing yes. what the word is telling you. You're yeah. in, you're Rather taking that message, reciting your whole it with you, yes, into your heart and not yes. the words. The words, I mean, because the words have been transformed and changed over and over again right. over time as we find different translations, different interpretations. 
I mean, just in the Christian Bible, there's you know dozens and dozens and dozens of different types depending on what the purpose is. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, you know, a God that is out of time, above us, far beyond any understanding we could imagine, we can't very well seem to think that we can limit his message completely to verbatim recitation of right. words because it's the whole essence of what he's saying there and what we're being told, what we're being shown in, in the narratives and in the illustrations. You know, that's when we get the parables. Storytelling is so powerful. So that's why those stick out for us. You know, those stories, we remember them, we take those to heart and we carry that lesson with us. And that's why stuff like this is in this book, right? The story of Corey Ten Boom mm -hmm. is because it personalizes it. It wraps it up in a, in a whole <coughs> passage of time that has a result that we can point to and say, wow, look at this. And so it stands out. Let's see. We're on his, his daughter. daughter. <coughs> his daughter, Corey, wrote, His blue eyes seemed to be seeing beyond a locked and crowded room, beyond Harlem, beyond earth itself, as he quoted from memory. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe. Psalm 119, 114, 117. Later in the concentration camp, she managed to get a Bible and to read it to fellow prisoners. The blacker the night around us grew, she recalled, the brighter and truer and more beautiful burned the word of God. And indeed, the nighttime of her life grew black. She endured the deaths of her father and her beloved sister, Betsy. She survived humiliation, cruelty, and neglect. But the word of God and the peace of God flowing from it brought her through the long nightmare so that she might emerge to bless the world with her message of hope. <coughs> That's a survivor. Yeah. That's a survivor. It's amazing. And, and you know, or earlier than that, we don't obviously we don't, can't make too many assumptions about what someone was feeling, but imagine that the younger kids going through these recitations and these devotions and kind of like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. you know, reading through it, listening, like, yeah, I'm being a good kid. I'm listening to dad, he's talking. What am I going to do later? I'm going to go kick rocks down the street and throw a can at somebody. Uh, it, you know, it, it isn't there, and so it's not until she's not appreciating it fully until she's at the point where she, this, the word Jesus is all that she has left in her world, and then in that moment she's she's seeing this great light in her darkest time, as she said. And it can be that for us if we stay in it and we keep it with us, and like we said, internalize it, take it in. Do that just by spending time in it. Alright. What's next? Hidden in plain sight. Does that story or perhaps something else in this chapter help you to feel differently about the book? Collecting dust on your shelf or on the back seat of your car where you left it on Sunday? It's not my intention to deal in guilt, but to motivate and encourage you to experience the great blessings that comes to those who read and love the Bible, to Bible as people over the ages have done. Some of the stories in this chapter have shown you how the Word of God has worked miracles in people's lives. It traveled on news print across the world to lead a woman to salvation in England. It strengthened a small knot of suffering humanity in a concentration camp. It captured the intellect of a future Indian American governor, governor of an American state. A rebellious young man had his life changed on a North Carolina road. Do you notice a pattern? These lives reflect many times and cultures and each dealt with intense crisis in some way or another. Time after time, the word of God was their lamp the light of their way. Lots yeah. and lots of examples. I mean, so many times, so many stories, so many illustrations that we get, that we can read, or just hear, you know, in the halls of the sanctuary, in the churches, about how God has moved in people's lives and, and turned it around for them, mm -hmm. made a change in their personalities or their activities or, or what have you but 
it's, it's amazing what he does, and often when we're not really looking for it. And we'll finish with the last one. The light seems to shine brightest for all when the darkness falls upon our surroundings. Our world is now in crisis, and many people I know are living with a sense of loss and a fear of the future. The world, word of God is available to convince your mind, to convict your will, and to comfort your heart. If you will read it, cherish it, and let it dwell within you richly, you will see the darkness retreat and the light of God's truth shine brightly in your life. If you remember the Bible's warnings that, that the Bible and the faith will come under increasing attacks and we'll get closer to the return of, as we get closer to the return of Jesus Christ, you will not cower in fear when spectics raise their voices, whether they are comedians who try to soften your defenses with humor, scholars who try to overwhelm your beliefs with intelligent arguments, or religious leaders who try to convince you that the Bible is just a book. You will be ready, you will remember that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Isaiah 48. Yeah. Yeah. Ironic that this was back in what, 2007? Is that you wrote this? Wasn't it? Something like that. So yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> like those two paragraphs are so perfect for right now, especially with the election wrapping up and fear of the future? No. Yeah. 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 Elections, COVID, riots, everything, yeah. So this uh, <clears throat> mocking of the, by the comedians and uh, that type of thing, where it's yeah. all one way. There's there's a lot of pressure to to be one with the world, and it's you know if you're sitting here doing things like this and and being grounded in your faith, that's that's open for mockery. And, you know, you're foolish and you're backwards and, and unintelligent. You. Cancel culture. That's, That's the whole idea. idea. You're right. not one with. Right. Well, cancel you. The, the so now. Line, you know. <laughs> if you ever watch Star Trek, the Borg, you know, you'll be assimilated. Yeah. <laughs> Resistance is futile. And that's, that's you know, and that's, sadly, that's how it is. You know, What's uh, really and sad it makes it difficult. Is that churches, there are a lot of churches that are More. actually trying to appease the world and trying to make everybody want to come to their church so we're going to accept this yeah we'll this is going to be okay that. because yeah. what's going to make you want to come to us and be here with us right. and you know yeah. yeah like that universal whatever yeah that's you're okay we're okay we're all okay yeah Just come and have thing in behind you. Yeah. it's like <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's no, true. It, it is. There's a lot of pressure, especially um, in the like 90s, early 2000s. There's a big emphasis on church growth, mm -hmm. but the wrong way. Right. You know, growth in numbers, growth in attendance, growth in giving, uh, or, you know, write books, and seminars, and surveys, and all this stuff. Uh, and the focus got away from spiritual growth mm -hmm. a little bit. You know, that's not, you know, it's not a fair generalization to make across the board, but it, it's it showed up in a lot of a lot of things. There was uh, a book about a very large survey of uh, it was close to ten thousand churches and and their people getting an idea of what people were looking for in church. Why did they come? What were they considering a spiritual experience and kind of breaking it out, seeing where people were in their journeys, you know, the, the new seeker, the not quite on the fence folks versus the folks that are died in the wool, you know, true believers that have the word buried in their heart, go to church four times a week and pray 25. And, um, and, and there was, you know, people were coming to church looking for different things. And that goes back to the perspective and their life experiences too, you know, we're all in different points. For a long time, I was there just to be supportive of her. And so messages and uh, you know, sermons weren't reaching me the same way they were reaching somebody else. There are some folks that come to church just because they have friends in the church. And, you know, so the message isn't 
reaching them the same way. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on finding the seeker, you know, bringing the seeker in, um, and it started to neglect the word because then you get all these, you know, flash, flashy stage shows and very eloquent speeches and flourishy stories, and then it started, you know, the word was less and less. Well, so, pile there in a contest. Yeah, yeah. And you got those mega churches that look like raves. Uh, yes. <laughs> like massive, massive churches. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it's not to, you know, Light shows uh, and everything. Mm -hmm. Not to diminish what the, you know, those people who are serving God in the way right. that they see yeah. is appropriate. There, there exactly. Um, but the priority is, is, is just a little different. You know? But it's in the seats versus word in the heart. But there is a lot of pressure, and it does. It gets into the churches. It, it, it alters sermons. It forces people to second guess what they're telling people. Mm -hmm. You know, should I preach this passage out of the Word? If I preach this, I'm going to offend. I'm going to offend these people, and they're not going to come back. Yeah. Yeah. And that's totally very real. Stay away from those. Oh, we're going to do that, right? Those yes. Right. Yeah. Pieces yeah. of the Bible that don't fit. We won't touch. We won't touch because those hearts. And, and those we'll lose those, those people. We'll lose that income. We'll lose. You know. So we'll just stay away from those parts, and we'll pick the, the happy, love, peace, acceptance stuff. Right. And people will be happy, and you know, yeah. Yeah. good to go. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a strong desire that acceptance, yeah. right? And sometimes they don't know. There was this gentleman that my father grew up with, and. He went to church. I, I don't think he started going until he got married, but they always, he and his wife always attended this one church and they went all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, God was a Christian. He was doing what God taught him to, and he brought his children up into the in that church and everything. And, and then um, his son kind of went away from that and went and, you know, started really, really reading the Bible and really searching it and stuff, and he started having a Bible study in his home. Hmm. And B started going to those Bible studies, and then all of a sudden, he started realizing, okay, I never heard this in my church. You know, all these things that he was, I never heard this stuff. I didn't. He says, I never realized I could have a relationship with God first off. I didn't know that. I didn't know, I didn't know how to become saved. I, he says, I realized I wasn't saved. All those, I wasn't saved because I didn't know. I wasn't taught that at the church. He says, I didn't know. Yeah. And he says, and I didn't know that. And he says, you know, it took my son to bring me to that point. And he says, now he says, I get it. He says, I get it. And he says, everything means so much more. And it's just so different, you know. But he didn't know. And there are a lot of places where people are going to church. And like I said, they're, they're doing the happy, feel good stuff. And they're not really teaching, and people don't, they don't really know. They don't yeah, know they what they're supposed know. to do, and, and, and how just, they're supposed to live. You're just supposed to be a, a better person. Right. And you're just, you're supposed to attend church and be a better person, and, you know, <clears throat> you shouldn't have problems, and if you do, don't let people see them, which is totally the opposite. I mean, that's the, just sometimes I hear from Kaylee is, couple of things that she said that I was telling Kathy was, so it's going to make me a better person if I worship this, whatever it is that you believe in. It's just going to make me a better person if I worship him my whole life. No, that's not the point at all. Yeah. Like, where are you getting this from? But it's my fault. I didn't bring her to church when she was growing up. And so she's got a very distorted point of view on um, corporate religion and yeah. called together. And the point that I was kind of trying to get her to was I had struggled for years and years myself because my parents dragged me kicking and screaming to church. <laughs> kicking and screaming until I kicked and screamed my way out the door and said, see you later, I'll never have anything to do it again. And yet whenever I was in my most de desperate times over the years, I mean, I remember being um, kicked out of a home when I was in a relationship in the middle of December, right about this time of year, I think, with a, how old was she? seven-year-old daughter approximately, with no place to go. My parents didn't live in town. I couldn't move in with mom and dad. Um, nowhere to go. <clears throat> so I drove to this church at eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning. I don't even remember which pastor it was. It was pastor at the time, because we're going back many, many years. Walked in the door, he didn't know who I was. Asked him to pray with me. 
I was devastated and lost, didn't know what I was going to do. Had a, a part time job <clears throat> because I had uh, not been successful at a, a attempt at a PhD down in Louisiana. I had moved home, it was a mess. Literally prayed with him, found a place to stay later that day. The next morning went to work and got asked if I wanted a full time job working for the, the Canadian company that was moving into town as a buying agent. Never, never bought a thing in my life for a retail company. But I was recommended by my super, I mean, he, God has rescued me my whole life, but I've never fully devoted myself to him until a couple years ago. And what I was trying to get across to her was, I had struggled, I had known God, I had read my Bible on and off. I'm not a better person because I worship him, my life has been saved by him for years. I'm finally giving him the, his due. I'm finally recognizing yes. him yes. for what he's done for me. And, and then so many times that he has pulled me out of the depths every time I begged him. And I do remember a couple of times just on my knees in the same types of situations. Because I'm not good with relationships. I have a bad track record there. And he's pulled me out and he's kept me afloat. And there's a few times where I could have really gone into some very bad, you know, scenarios and worse than I ever did anyways. And so what I was trying to get across to her is that it, you don't, you're not just a better person, you don't just stop struggling because you're in a relationship with God, you have somebody to turn to. And he does answer prayer. And ironically, we have this really long conversation, because I've been on quarantine again, <laughs> don't work in the schools. And I was telling mom and dad that we had this whole long political and religious, religious and whatever conversation, and then I said, well, I'm just gonna keep praying for you as I always will, you know? And the next day, she got two pieces of news. She got accepted into the nursing program that she's been waiting and waiting and waiting on, and she got called about a job. And so when I got home from work, because she had texted me at work, and I said, close your ears, Kaylee. Thank you, God, for answering prayer. <laughs> and then, ironically, um, I told my mother, and she said, tell Kaylee I've been praying for two things for her every morning, for the, the nursing program and for a job. And so Kaylee was like, well, I guess God knew that I needed a break. And I said, yeah, maybe God knew I needed a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, the concept of the religion for that. Yeah. Well, I'll just keep praying for her because that's what I do with him. And even Cody, unfortunately, Cody, it took something drastic. But yeah, well, it's just a, yeah, he's yeah, there now, you know. Yeah. It's been amazing to see his plus years. years. Yeah. 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 It's, keep praying. Absolutely. That's what I just. Uh, that's what I say to her. I pray that God has a plan for you. I, I really believe that. And I, same with my uh, boyfriend. She's like, I don't get your relationship. We've dated for almost nine years, and we we've never lived together. We've never. And she's like, I, Wow, I can't believe you guys are. You know, because <clears throat> we spend time in the barn in the evening. Sometimes she loves the cows. And I said, Kaylee, God has a plan for him. He's going to come around at some point because he has a, a, a neighbor farmer that keeps witnessing to him. Can't mm. quite grasp because he'll read the Old Testament. He said, "What kind of a God would have you know?" Uh, he'll read the War and the Slaughter or something, mm. so he doesn't really grasp. But I keep planting seeds. Yeah. Yeah, that's all you can do. Plant the seeds and ask God to open his heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think we all can say that at some point in time, God has carried us. We thought we were doing the donors, but you know, now that I look back. He never tired from picking me up and carrying me along, and I know that, yeah. to bring me here. Yeah, which is one of those things you have to keep, when things are, are time, kind of rough now, you have to sometimes stop and think, they think well, wait a minute, God's brought me this far. Yep. Yeah. He's brought me this far, he's gonna get me through this too. Mm -hmm. You know, because sometimes you don't, you don't think about it until, like I said, later on, all of a sudden you realize, well, look what he brought me through. And I didn't even realize sometimes that he was, he was carrying that he was, he was, but he was. And we just, yeah, you just have to keep thinking that. It's like, okay. Mm -hmm. And instead of my initial, here we go again, why do I have to keep going through this God? You know, now I try to stop and say, okay, is there a different way that I could face this or react to it so that maybe I could handle it better? And like I was telling Kathy, um, because I've been very frustrated with my daughter for the same reasons, she literally sent me a text this morning that showed me her screen, like the weekly screen time update. And she said the, the, the comment was, well, there's a full-time job right there. 
Her screen time this past week averaged eight hours and some odd minutes a day. Yeah, she can literally sit in the living room with me after work, after, you know, probably out of bed at noon, one o'clock, because she just moved home a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. She'd been working full time and everything, but is waiting on her next step in life, I guess. <laughs> but she'll sit across from me for four hours and not say a word, just stare at her phone. Mm -hmm. For number one, get these boxes unpacked, because I'm about ready to. <laughs> but I have maintained without getting into a screaming match, without losing my temper, without. And that's the part that I feel like God is teaching me is you need to change you also because there's there's reasons that your daughter has these views and these you know I raised her I can't just put it all back on her so um, I'm learning situation <laughs> lots of learning going on here <laughs> lots of grace lots of patience I uh, wish I don't have <laughs> that's, the, that's the part yeah. of the struggle with yeah. but we're doing a little better. Especially when you're quarantined. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's one thing to say there's nowhere, like nowhere to go, nothing to do because of the winter and the weather. And the mm -hmm. Right. It's another to say I can't yeah. because I needed her to give me just go to the store and pick up the stuff for Thanksgiving dinner or something. Mm -hmm. You literally do nothing else. Okay. <laughs> you had to go to the store, Kaylee. My employer said you can't come here. So That's something we're going to have to look, we're going to have to adjust to when Cody gets out is he's got supervision for five years and he's got to be with us. He's what? I'm sorry. He has to be supervised for five years. Oh. And he's going to live with family, so it's going to be an adjustment. <laughs> Lots of rules and things that you have to go by. Yeah. Yeah. Does he have specific release date, you mean? Or? No, I mean, no, he'll be in his 30s. It all goes, yeah. He's doing everything he can to, you know, get time taken off and right. everything. But a lot can change between now and then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I mean I still pray for him every day because while he's doing great right now and has his head on straight, I mean he's gonna be there for a while, so yeah. Yeah. Are you guys gonna be able to go down and see him again? Um See, he's about four hours away right now, so the yeah. problem is we have to pay for a hotel because with COVID right now, we only two of us can visit at once. Oh, yeah. So we have to first of all go on a weekend where he has Saturday visits, and then so we have to get a hotel, we have to pay for boarding for the dogs, and it's a long drive, so we kind of space it out. So right. we just saw him, and we're going to go probably for his birthday next. So, um, and I think it might actually even fall like, on his birthday weekend to check again but, but he's really thinking of putting in for a transfer to was it Clinton no Clinton it's only about two hours away which I mean that's a day trip you know right. especially if we can only have two visit at a time you know just yeah and we can go you know several times a month versus right yeah so yeah so the, the spacing between visits has been rough but no, he calls as much as he can. Right. Um, I'm not gonna like, jump off into the next section. I'll leave that for Paul. <laughs> that's, that's a whole other different area. Um, I kind of feel like I might have to go back and read the rest of this book because. <laughs> This has been a really uh, interesting discussion, and he's got some good stuff in here. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty good, uh, pretty good thing. <laughs> but I guess just remembering that you know that's that the word of God is definitely a treasure. It's been shown so many times, and you know we keep it with us over anything else. You know, if we have to save anything from the fire, it's <laughs> it's the word, right? Yeah. You know, we can replace all the things around us that stress us out and make us worry. And, you know, it's horrible when we lose stuff, but it's just stuff in the end. But if we keep the word with us, you know, even when we're lacking stuff, it can be the thing that brings us up out of you know, those dark spots. All our possessions, all the things that we try to, you know, that we covet and save and store away, 
They make us feel good for a moment, like, oh, wow, look at this thing. I haven't seen it in five years because it's been in a box, but what? Hey, look at it. You know? Uh, but, Back you know, in the box. It's we'll not going to. Again, five years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll move it over to this other corner and we'll feel so bad about keeping it for a while. So, Kaylee, literally, because I was quarantined, I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, let's just go through some of this stuff. So, if I'm like right there in her room with her, and she would pull out like her swim jacket from, you know, sophomore year. Has that been in a box since sophomore year? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, you know, like you just kept going through stuff and, and like on the, the screen time thing I had pointed out to her that I had made it a point um, several months back, um, a few months into quarantine, my screen time just kept going up and up and up because what else is there to do? But it was summer and there's plenty to do outside and there's no reason I'm staring at my screen and I do have a Bible and there's much other things that I could be doing besides, you know. So I actually, you know, just I unloaded the Facebook app and, and other things like that that were just like bogging my, my brain down. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm just going to focus on getting that screen time like down. And so uh, there should be less than like one hour max. That's, mm -hmm. And so I did. I'm not on my phone. And then the next thing I thought to myself is, how much time did I spend staring at this TV compared to either reading my Bible and other, you know, valuable materials in my brain like maybe I could read about history because when I was in school I didn't want to learn anything about history. I didn't want to learn you know things that might be helpful to my brain so like things like that so I've tried very hard to switch it I'm not overly successful yet because sometimes you just want to sit there and like stare at the TV so like I'm not fully and I'm not as successful as that as getting off the screen time like I don't want to be on a laptop or anything like that but um, sometimes I do just want to sit and stare at the TV I find you know it's for the bitch. like watching The Office for like the 50th time I've, I never watched The Office but uh what was I watching The Midwife okay I think I've seen I feel like I've seen like simple ones like that like I like uh, old yeah. time period stuff yeah. and things like that I really enjoy just time period as long as it's not Trashy or soap opera or right. anything like that that just drives me crazy, but um, just old stuff or rewatching old movies, you know. And I think that's that's what my brain wants to do, just fetch. And I'm like, I should get off the couch and go something. I should. <laughs> yeah. We're funny creatures. It's it's so hard to dispose of things that aren't necessary, and yet we struggle so much to bring in the things that we really, really need. Yeah, I'm, I'm a happy, I'm a happy sure. person in my room. It's tough to break. <laughs> I think, set, like you did, setting yourself achievable goals that incrementally get you yeah. to where you want to be. Baby steps. Yeah. Small, yeah. And working Small in steps. those things that are meaningful. You know, mm -hmm. take, I'm going to set aside, you know, these 15 minutes, just 15 minutes, I'm going to sit and just read. And then that will turn into, oh, well, I, I got sucked in, and half an hour later, or an hour later, you know, it's, sometimes it's getting your foot out the door. You know, when I was still running, you know, that was the hardest. Like, it's a long run day, I got 12 miles. And it's, it's just those first steps of getting out the door, I was just grumbling and griping and mm, Everything kicking going to the stretches and then you get half a mile uh, down the road and I'm like, oh, okay. And you're going, I'm really glad I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We finished up and felt amazing, was energized and ready to go, but man, <laughs> getting off that couch and getting out the door was just yeah. the worst. <laughs> it was awful. Yeah. Well, and yep. just, just getting that momentum in the right direction. Having your Bible there, you know, and, and then it's right in front of you, and then you have to make the choice because the choice is in front of you. Bible, Bible, Bible. Mm. Remote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's an instance where a coffee table is helpful. For us, it just gathers. Yeah, things. Recently, it seems <laughs> that my Bible is getting farther and farther away from my eyes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I need a large print Bible. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like I have it on my tablet so I can make the font really big, but only a, like a paragraph fits on at a time, so I'm like this. Yes. <laughs> and then if I want to go back to, you know, reread or double check or find a spot, I'm like... Yeah. I can get aggravating like, where was yeah, I? Yeah, I want the Bible. I want yeah. the pages so I can flip back if I want to check what Isaiah said because somebody quote, you know... Mm -hmm. Don't get old. Don't get old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a struggle. Your arms just stop getting long enough at some point. Some reading glasses in Some people have them, but they don't wear them. Cheaters scattered around the house. That's common too. There they go. Yeah.
Yeah. Petra Supply has like three, three packs and five packs. There's just, there's some somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> well, anybody have any other thoughts on this, this, this section that we read? Or we can close up and kind of socialize. Okay, we still have that kind of note. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> Well, we close in prayer, and then we can have just some brief, more uh, socializing fellowship time. Well, Heavenly Father, thank you for all the things that you continue to show us every day, uh, every moment that we spend with you, uh, with one another, uh, sharing your word, sharing the thoughts that we have about your word, Lord. Uh, we need the perspectives of others. We're so thankful for folks like Dr. David Jeremiah for uh, taking the time and, and lending his uh, input so that we can facilitate these discussions, Lord. Um, we ask that you bless this day for everyone gathered around here, uh, everyone that shows up in the sanctuary, and everybody that's connected to them. Um, we know that we need your guidance, we need your strength, and we need your love. Most of all, we need your forgiveness and grace. Um, we thank you every day for that, Lord. Um, we ask that you uh, continue to bless this Advent season, help us to grow closer to one another safely, um, keep everybody healthy, just uh, ask all those many things in your whole being. Amen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>